All right, good morning. Um, my name is Cesar. Uh, I'm a member of Sila Covenant Church. I've been attending Sila Covenant Church now for uh, a little over three years, and I'm also part of the leadership team. I'm very excited to be able to share with you this morning um, what uh, God has prepared for us. Um, so uh, the first thing I, I want to uh, do is actually, um, you guys know we've been actually going through the Gospels over the last couple months, three or four months. Um, so today we're going to be talking about uh, what comes after the Gospels, sort of. Um, and we're going to be uh, camping in the book of Acts, chapter 1. So the book of Acts is actually the continuation to the Gospel of Luke. And um, it offers, in the first chapter, a detailed account of what happened after the resurrection. So Acts 1, uh, verse 1 through 14, and you should be able to see it up there. Um, it says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said these, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So, lots of really strange things happening in that passage. Um, for one, I've never seen anybody go into heaven. I don't know if you have, but uh, if I saw anybody being taken up by a cloud into heaven, I would be very shocked. I'd be like, okay, that, you don't see that every day. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, recently, uh, uh, Sam Harris, an athe he's a famous atheist, he was all over the internet uh, for an, an interview he gave where he touched on many topics, politics, and a lot of controversial opinions that, that he gave there made this thing go sort of viral. And one of the things he said, he was actually talking about Christianity, he's a strong opponent of it, and he said, um, quote, I'm not going to make magical claims about flying saviors who are literally going to come down from where? Where is exactly heaven, given that we have multiple telescopes up there beaming back information? Okay. So, we, we laugh, but, I mean, in his worldview, all there is is the material world. So if, he, if, heaven, if Jesus was taken up to heaven, and we have telescopes up there, and he can't see Jesus, then therefore Jesus is just a, a tail. So, but if somebody actually showed you the, this clip and said, look, you know, we know the material world is all there is, we have telescopes out, up there, where is heaven? Can you show me where heaven is? That's a really good question. I actually had a conversation with my kids, kids recently. We have three kids, uh, nine, seven, and five-year-olds. And um, I asked them, where, where do you think heaven is? And one of them said, up. The other one said, well, the place where people go when they die if they believe in Jesus. And uh, the other one said, is where Jesus is. And these are all good answers, uh, you know, at least in... In our, in our Christian faith, 
Um, they would be good answers. Um, and so you, you probably have an idea of heaven in your mind, right? Like when somebody says heaven, you, some, something pops up in your mind, a picture. Like if you're uh, uh, a lover of classical art, maybe is uh, uh, naked chubby babies playing harps. Um, you know, I'm a soccer fan, so in my house, uh, we don't call it soccer, we actually call it football. And my kids, uh, my kids know that I'm a huge fan, so if I had to choose heaven, what, what it looked like, it would be a nice green soccer field where I'm playing soccer with my friends forever, for eternity. That would be heaven. Uh, if you're a Washington State Cougar fan, then yesterday's as close to heaven as it gets. Um, <laughs> at least until Thanksgiving. Uh, so, but it is an important question, right? I mean, after all, if we don't know where heaven is or what it looks like, what's the point of going there? Um, so today I want us to try to answer that question by looking at the text that we just read and then in the context of the grand story of the Bible. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm actually, I want us to define heaven. And I'm, we're going to do that by leaning on some of the stuff that we've read over the last few months. So the first one is, um, we know that in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew actually talks, uh, when, when Jesus is making his announcement, he actually uses the, the uh, he says that the, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or the kingdom of heaven is near. So Jesus is making the claim that the kingdom of heaven, it's, it's coming it's, it's close at hand. Like we, We're almost there. Um, in the Gospel of Luke, in the Gospel of Mark, and in John, uh, what you find is that they don't really use that language as much. What they say most of the time that Jesus is proclaiming is the kingdom of God. Therefore, if we equate the two, we can say that heaven is where God reigns. So that's the first thing. The next thing is uh, we... When we look at uh, the Lord's Prayer, and most, if you grew up in church, you probably know it. Even if you didn't grow up in church, you probably heard it. Uh, the first four lines are, Our Father in heaven, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. So um, we could define heaven as the place where God is, Right? That's the first line, our Father in heaven. Where God reigns, which is what we just said before, and then where his will is done. Right? It says the last line is your will, the last two lines, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, and by the way, we have in the bulletin, we have a few questions that you can follow. And this would be the second question. Heaven is the place where God is, reigns, and where his will is done. And then the first question was, if someone asked you where heaven is, what would you answer? And feel free to paint a picture there if you want to. Um, so, the heaven as the place where God is, reigns, and his will is done, sounds like I'm saying the same thing three times, but I'm not. And um, the first thing is, well, a king could reign in a faraway land by using you know, delegates or viceroys or uh, officers that he sends to that land. And, you know, so he could reign remotely. So you don't have to be, if you're a king, you don't have to be where you reign. But in this case, heaven is actually where God is and where he also reigns. So his throne is in heaven. Then the second thing is uh, a king could give orders, but... Um, it is a different matter if those orders are actually followed, right? So I could say I'm the king of my, king of my house, but you probably know that my will is not perfectly done at home. Uh, if you're a parent, you probably experience the same thing, so you're not the king of your house. Um, and then the last thing is God is omnipresent. So we know that God is everywhere. So God is not just in heaven. However, we also know that Earth is the place where God's will is not actually done. And we know that because, you know, if we go to the book of Genesis, we find that um, in Genesis 1 and 2, the, you, you probably, if you grab again in church, you're familiar with the story. The, uh, in the beginning, 
the Spirit of God is hovering over the earth, and then he proceeds to um, order the earth that is void and formless or wild and waste, and then uh, he proceeds to uh, create a garden. And we read in Genesis 2 that he planted a garden toward the east in Eden. And then he plays the man there, and he has him, he orders, he basically places Adam there to cultivate the garden. And in a, in a way, it's like uh, God is placing, well, uh, the, the point there I, uh, that I'm trying to make is that uh, God is with man at the garden. So there's, there's a few observations that I want us to, to take from there. Um, the first one is the garden in Eden is actually not the whole earth. It's actually a, a very specific place in Eden. It's a small garden. The garden has, uh, uh, is described as having lots of water, lots of trees, uh, lots of flowers, animals. Um, and then there's some description that's kind of weird. The Bible says that there was gold and pre- precious stones in that garden too. Um, and then he planted, the Lord planted two trees in the middle of the garden, we know, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And we also read that God um, would come in the afternoon and spend time with man. Um, so in the beginning, we know then the, the, the God's presence is in the garden. So uh, this is the third point in the bulletin. The garden of Eden, or the garden in Eden, was the place where heaven and earth overlapped in the beginning. So you could think of heaven uh, as a realm or a circle, and then earth as a different circle, and then the place where they overlap is like a Venn diagram. That is the Garden of Eden in the beginning. And then we all know what happens afterwards. Um, Adam and Eve choose to take from the tree of good and evil, evil, which basically represents a choice that they make to no longer uh, accept God's boundaries of what he has defined as good, and, um, but instead they're trying to challenge those definitions based on their own wisdom, and, and then God no, longer can, God, God no longer can keep them uh, in the garden that he has defined as very good because they, want, they are trying to explore uh, these new definitions. And so they get exiled from the garden, and uh, they get exiled from the source of life. That's what the tree of life represents, and therefore, when they go outside, eventually they will die. But the main point here is that when that happens, heaven and earth are now separated. They're split. Man can no longer go back to the garden and enter the presence of God like they did before the fall. And so humans lose that access, um, and we keep reading... Oh, well, well, there's one more thing that I want us to notice there, actually. Um, Notice that God isn't the one leaving. God doesn't leave the garden. It is humans who actually have to go out of the garden. God stays in the garden. Um, So the the story of the Bible continues, and then we get to the book of Exodus. And in the book book of Exodus, um, God, God frees the Israelites from the Egyptians, and he guides them. Uh, and if you remember the story, he guides them with a cloud during the day and then a pillar of fire at night. And what that signifies is basically God is guiding them. And eventually they get to Mount Sinai, and Moses receives the plans of a tent that he needs to build. Um, and then basically God enters into a covenant with Israel where they are supposed to be his people, and he is supposed to be he, their God. And this tent is supposed to signify the place where Israel can go to and access the presence of God. And so the, the tent, when we read the, the description, uh, we see that the instructions actually show that there's uh, a lot of uh, uh, curtains and pictures and images of what the Garden of Eden actually looked like. So there's, uh, there's trees that are supposed to be uh, drawn uh, or, or painted on, on, on the walls. Uh, there's lots of flowers. Uh, there's gold and precious stones. And then at the inauguration of the tabernacle, the presence of God comes down and fills 
the temple in the form of a cloud of fire. And actually, we're going to read that in Exodus 40, verses 34 through 38. It says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if, they could, but if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle day, uh, by day, and fire was in the cloud by night in the sight of all the Israelites during all their travels. So, again, this tabernacle, and then later the, the temple, are the place where Israel can access the presence of God. Um, when we read the, the description of the inauguration of the temple, it is very similar. Uh, the, the glory of God comes down to the temple, it fills it with a cloud, um, and so we could say that the temple, and this is the fourth point in your bulletin, the temple was a portal between heaven and earth. So a portal, you know, you could think of it as like uh, if you've watched Thor, there's a portal in that movie. Um, it, you could think of it as an embassy, right? When you go to an embassy, you're in a foreign country, you go to the U.S. embassy, that embassy serves two purposes. The first one is it is your home country. It is the U.S. in that country. It's like the, the, the building is actually part of the United States. If you go into that building, you're no longer in the foreign country, whatever you are. That's the first thing. So it's representing that government in that country. And then the second one is actually representing uh, the country to the people. Uh, so in this case, it would be like the U.S. is being represented by that embassy to the people in that country. So it serves sort of a dual purpose. And it was the same thing with the temple. The high priest was actually uh, Israel's representative to God for, for the people. So when the high priest goes into the temple or into the tabernacle, he's acting as Israel's representative before God. And then the second function is when that high priest comes out of that temple, uh, he is now representing God to the people of Israel. So it's dual purpose. Um, and that's also why the temple is so important to the Israelites. That's why we read in some of the stories that, you know, Daniel would open his windows and he would face towards Jerusalem to pray. It's because when, whenever I want to talk to someone, I'm, I don't turn around my back and start talking. Actually, I'm talking to that person face to face. Then the story, the story move, moves forward and we read that eventually because of Israel's um, unfaithfulness, the glory of God leaves the temple. The presence of God is no longer there. Foreign nations come and conquer Israel and uh, they desecrate the temple, they destroy it. And eventually a remnant comes back to Jerusalem and tries to rebuild the temple and they do rebuild the temple. But then when they inaugurate, they're expecting the same thing to happen. They're expecting the cloud to come and be filled uh, with the presence of God. And that doesn't happen. And God is silent for 400 years. And then Jesus shows up. And now Jesus is going around telling people that the kingdom of heaven is near. And so what immediately pops up in the disciples' minds is, great, the cloud is eventually going to come back to the temple and we'll be able to see the cloud and the presence of God and fire at night. But then, we know the story, we just read it in the Gospels. Jesus is apprehended. He's crucified by the Jewish leaders and the Romans. The disciples' hopes are dashed. Jesus' body is buried in a tomb and on the third day, Something miraculously, a miracle happens. Jesus comes back to life. And that's where the text that we just read picks up. Uh, Jesus stays with disciples for 40 days, convincing them, hey, it is me. I have come back to life. Um, he speaks to them again about the kingdom of God, 
God, the kingdom of heaven. And then the disciples, um, I imagine they, they probably were very curious. They must have been waiting. Okay, okay, Lord, is it now that you're going to restore the kingdom of God to Israel? Like, are we, are we going to the temple? Is this thing finally going to happen? And his response is uh, a little disappointing, I think, for them. But it's not, his response is not, uh, no, 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 you got it all wrong. There's not going to be a kingdom. Uh, what he actually says is, um, he says, you are going to be my witnesses. You're going to go out to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the rest, and, and, and everywhere else in, on earth. And so the first thing that we should notice is like, there's an order to what Jesus is describing, right? So uh, if you remember the, the map that I showed you a few weeks ago, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. It's a city. Judea is actually the surrounding region around Jerusalem. Samaria is the region to the north of um, Judea. And then the, the ends of the earth is basically everything else. So uh, in a sense, God, is, uh, Jesus is, is saying, hey, you have a mission, and your mission is actually to go be my representatives at all these places. It's like Jesus is wanting to open embassies in places um, other than Jerusalem. The second thing that uh, we should notice, um, if you keep actually reading after the, the last verse we read, uh, you'll find out that they were at the Mount of Olives um, when Jesus is taken up to heaven, which is strange. Uh, if there was a place where Jesus could have gone up to heaven, again, it would have been the portal, the temple. But he's not at the temple when this happens. Instead, a cloud comes to the Mount of Olives and takes Jesus up to heaven. And so the disciples stay, and we read how they were basically praying and fasting, um, doing what Jesus ordered them to do. They stay in Jerusalem. And then on the day of Pentecost, tongues of fire come to rest over them, right? There, there's a wind, it says, wind comes that came from heaven, rushes into the room, and fires, uh, and, and tongues of fire show up, show up on top of the uh, apostles' heads, and they start speaking in tongues. Wild. Uh, but what that is supposed to mean, now that we've read everything about how the, t the, the temple was filled with cloud, with fire at night. What this is signifying is that God's presence is now inside these disciples. It's no longer just in the confines of the temple. It's actually now inside those disciples. The disciples now have access to the presence of God through the Holy Spirit. So, in other words, that gap that we talked about that was between heaven and earth after the fall has now been bridged by the Holy Spirit. And we know that when this Holy Spirit empower human do God's will, basically what they're doing is they're participating in the kingdom of heaven. They're expanding it. It's like they are delegates of heaven working to expand God's kingdom on earth and bring in the kingdom of heaven on earth. In other words, bringing heaven to earth. So, where is heaven? Coming back to our original question, where is heaven? So now we could say that heaven is the realm where Jesus currently is, right? So where God reigns, where God is, where his will is done. We know Jesus is also there because he was taken up by a cloud. Um, but we also just discovered that it's also a space where we can access, we, we have access through by God's Holy Spirit today. So, if, uh, and this is the fifth point in your bulletin, the story of the Bible from the beginning up until what I, what I just mentioned, has been the effort of God trying to bridge heaven, trying to bring heaven and earth back together as one. Now, we know that 
that same, that same spirit that empowered the, uh, the apostles, um, it's everywhere on earth, but obviously God's will is still not done everywhere on earth. On earth. So um, we know that the kingdom is, has started. There's embassies, right? We are supposed to be that embassy. If we are living lives that are empowered by the spirit, um, which means you don't actually have to wait till you die to go to heaven. We can experience heaven today, here, um, by living lives that are empowered by the Holy Spirit. So this is why the story of the Bible in general, and then the story of Jesus, Jesus' life, death and resurrection in particular, are good news today. Is because this, the gospel is not just a ticket to go to heaven. It's actually uh, an invitation to build heaven on earth today. Jesus has opened a way for us to be in God's presence and experience the kingdom of heaven now. He's calling us to be his viceroys, his delegates. That was the whole point from the beginning. Like Adam was supposed to be God's viceroy by cultivating that garden in the beginning, but he, he didn't do it. And so we are called to do that now. So, so if I just stop the message right there and I said, okay, great, wonderful, go be, go be the people of God. Uh, and, and you thought, great, yeah, I just finished reading my Gospels. Um, I know everything that Jesus said I was supposed to do. I'm going to create a to-do list, and I'm just going to follow that. And I should be good, right? And uh, two things may happen. Like, one, if you actually believe that you are able to do all these things that Jesus said you should do as his disciple, you may be tempted to become proud because it's based off of what you are doing. Um, you may be tempted to uh, believe that maybe you are better than others. Um, look at me. Uh, I may be, I'm doing everything. I'm part of heaven. And those people over there, they're not. Um, pride may creep in, and uh, you may become judgmental. Now, you may actually be self-aware and realize, hey, actually, I tried to follow that to-do list, and it's not going so well. I'm actually not able to do that. Um, that might lead you to despair, may lead you to frustration. Um, I know that uh, whenever I try to do all these things on my own, whenever I try to be heaven on earth, um, it doesn't go well. <laughs> my kids can testify to that. So that's where this idea of the high priest becomes really important. The high priest uh, in the temple, like we mentioned, was God's representative to the people, but he was also the people's representative to God. And so the, the, the story that we just read is showing that God went into the real temple, the real temple of heaven, and he is our high priest. You probably, if you have read your uh, uh, New Testament, there's lots of places where it says that, uh, especially in the book of Hebrews, that Jesus is our high priest. What that means is that when God is looking at his people, he's not looking at you individually. He's looking at Jesus. He's looking at what Jesus did, what he accomplished. And that's why that is good news. It's because it's not based on what I have to do. It's not based on whether I'm filling all the check boxes in my to-do list is based on what Jesus already did for me. And that's why God is then also able to send his spirit into us, because he's actually seeing us through the lenses, through the lens of Jesus. He's our high priest. So Jesus, in, in, uh, in one of the gospels, he says, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? All we have to do is ask. We want to ask to be 
filled with the Holy Spirit and become Jesus' disciples today. Um, 1 Corinthians 12.4 also says that no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So if you accept to be in that kingdom of Jesus, if you accept Jesus as your king, that means you're already accepting to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, so that's the uh, sixth point in, your, in, in our bulletins today. We get to experience, experience heaven on earth when we receive God's Spirit to live according to His will. Now, the story of the Bible doesn't end there, right? Uh, if you keep reading, you eventually get to the book of Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, uh, in, verse, in chapter 21, verses 1 through 4, John... The seer who wrote the book says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look! God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe out every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the, older, for the old order of things have, has passed away. So if someone asks you where heaven is, you can tell them that there are glimpses of heaven here when God's people do God's will. And someday, heaven will be fully here on earth. That's the story of the Bible. So um, I want to invite you to pray with me. Um, uh, if, if you are able to stand, uh, please do so, and uh, let's pray, let's ask God that he would um, fill our hearts with his Holy Spirit, um, that we would be empowered by it, that we would be able to see when we, are, when we fall short, and be able to come to the high priest, priest Jesus, to heal our hearts, and then to thank him because God is actually looking at us through him in his holy temple in heaven. So pray with me. Dear Father, uh, thank you that you desire to live with us, Lord. Um, I don't know why. I know I, uh, my wife probably can testify to it. I wouldn't want to live with me, but you do want to live with us. This is what you've been trying to do from the beginning, is to bridge that gap that we have caused, that separation that we, um, that we, that we chose. You have been from the beginning trying to reach down to us, Lord, and you have done that personally through your Son, Jesus Christ. You came who came and, and lived a life that we could not live and open a way for us to experience your presence in our hearts and in our lives, Lord. I ask that your Holy Spirit would be coming down um, like in Acts 1 to empower us, Lord, um, to live lives where um, we don't become proud because we know why we, can't, we have access to you, Lord, but we are also not in despair because you have done it already for us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.